Warm welcome to those who are listening to our service from Drumbolg Reformed Presbyterian Church today. God's word says, set your trust upon the Lord, rejoice in him, and he will give you the desires of your hearts. As you know, the meeting houses are closed for two weeks, so we go back to services online. We'll continue our series on the life of Jacob today. And I would remind you of the evening service this evening, uh, available on YouTube and also conference call at 8pm. We commence our worship uh, as we turn together to Psalm 37. And uh, we're going to listen as verses 1 to 6 are sung in praise. The psalmist calls us to trust, to continue living as we know we should, to rejoice in the Lord, committing everything to him, and he will vindicate his people. Psalm 37, verses 1 to 6. Let us pray. O God, our loving Heavenly Father, once again we bow in prayer and approach the throne of grace. We come through our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, that one at your right hand, and we seek 
the help of the Holy Spirit as we gather for worship on this Sabbath day. Lord, we put our trust in you. We would commit everything, Lord, to you. And we pray that the joy of the Lord will be our strength even today. We thank you for the promise that you vindicate your people who seek to trust and obey. And we pray that we would heed the psalmist when he says, Rest in the Lord and patiently wait for him. In these days of crisis, we pray that you would give us that patience and may we know that rest in the Lord. So, Father, we come to commit our services today to you and ask that you will bless your word as it's opened up and preached. And we pray, Lord, that there will be a word for each one who is listening today. So, Lord, draw near to us as we seek to draw near to you. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory, asking with the forgiveness of all our sins, through Jesus Christ, our risen, reigning Lord and Saviour, and for his sake. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture reading is taken from Genesis chapter 25. We read from verse 19 to verse 34. So Genesis chapter 25 from verse 19. This is the account of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was forty years old when he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer. And his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out, with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man, staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I am famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to, to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Our parallel reading is from the New Testament, from the writer to the Hebrews, chapter 12 and verse 14. Hebrews, chapter 12 and the 14th verse. Make every effort 
to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. We'll end our readings there. We know that God will bless to us the reading of his own infallible and inerrant word. Our second psalm today is Psalm 62, Selection B, and uh, we will hear verses 1 to 5 sung. The psalmist reminds himself and his hearers of the Saviour, and he says, The Lord and the Lord only is my Saviour, my rock, the foundation of my life. I, I, my hope only comes from him. He gives me hope. That's why I'm able to carry on. He's my saviour, he says, so I will not be moved. And then he calls upon us, O people, in him put your trust. Not only that, but as you come to worship, pour out all your heart. We know that God is watching over us. We can face the future without fear. So we pour out our hearts in worship and in praise. Psalm 62, 1 to 5.
Loving Heavenly Father, once again we draw near in prayer, remembering that you have said, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. We thank you for these wonderful words of the psalmist. You, Lord, are the only Saviour. You're the only source of hope as we look to the future. You're the one who is glorious. You're the one who deserves our worship for all that you are and all that you have done. And so we pray that you will help us not only to put our trust in you today, but to pour out our hearts in praise, in worship, in adoration. Father, we pray that as we consider again the account of your people in Scripture, in particular thinking about Jacob, we pray that you would speak to us from his life. We thank you, Lord, that you, by your grace, were able to change him so that from being a cheat and a supplanter, he became a prince with God. We pray that we'll be challenged. We pray that we'll be encouraged. We live, Lord, in very solemn times. We remember, O oh Lord, the grieving. We remember those who are suffering. We remember those who are caring for those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. We do thank you that the light has begun to shine into the darkness that uh, you're answering our prayers with regard to a vaccine for uh, the virus. And we pray, loving Father, that 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 will come to pass and be successful. But we also pray that what you're saying to us, not only in this country, but in countries to the ends of the earth, you are calling us, as the psalmist said, to be still to think about our lives, to ask ourselves, are we living in a way that pleases you or are we living in our family life and in our national life? Are we living in a way that will only bring judgment upon us? So turn us, O Lord, away from sinful paths and help us to find Christ as the rock of our salvation, the fortress uh, and the saviour of all who trust in him. So Lord, we pray for your blessing now as we open up your word. We pray for the help of the Holy Spirit that uh, the word would come with power and uh, there might be liberty, Lord, in the preaching of the word and that you, by your Holy Spirit, would bless those who listen and speak to them. So, Lord, we repeat the words of young Samuel in the temple. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we come today to our third study in the life of Jacob and I've entitled this study, A Tale of Two Brothers. So if your Bible is there with you, please turn with me to the passage that we read from Genesis chapter 25, focusing especially on verses 24 down to verse 34. So that's... Genesis 25, especially from verse 24. Now, as you look down this passage, and as you've heard it read, perhaps you're wondering, what is there for me today from this story? Well, I just remind you of what I have said each Sabbath day as we've pursued this study. And that is a reminder of Paul's letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
when he speaks about the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. For all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And uh, of course, as you also know, the scripture itself draws special attention to this episode as we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 to 17. This chapter takes us into what we might call the nitty-gritty of everyday family life, where children are born and grow up, and where character is formed, and where things happen that shape the future for better or for worse. So let's look at our passage under various headings, each heading beginning with B. And the first is the birthright. The birthright. It's mentioned four times there between verses 31 and 34. And it's crucial that we understand what this is all about, the birthright. We read of it in Genesis 18 and again in chapter 22 and chapter 27. We also read about it in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and 1 Chronicles chapter 5. And if we look at these passages together, they show us that the birthright involved really, if we boil it right down, it involved three things. First of all, the firstborn son received twice as much property as each of the other sons. It's called a double portion. Secondly, the firstborn son became the head of the family, the leader of the family. But not only that, thirdly, the firstborn son became the spiritual leader of the family. He's the one who would build the altar and take a lead in offering sacrifices. Remember at this time we didn't have the tabernacle or the temple so the head of the family was like the priest who offered the sacrifices on behalf of the family. Now in the line of Abraham this was especially important because this was the line of descent by which the Messiah was going to be born into the world. So this was the situation of that time. And we know that the rights of the firstborn could be legally allocated to another son in the family. We know this from archaeological finds which have, been, which have instructed us with regard to these matters. So the birthright. But then secondly we see the battle. Verse 22 tells us that within the very womb of Rebecca there was conflict. She was expecting twins and there was conflict between the two. Now, of course, uh, it's not just a matter of uh, feeling the movements of the unborn. Rebecca felt there was more going on here than normal. This was quite a violent struggle that was taking place. And she felt this must be significant. And so it was. Because it... it spoke of a struggle between the twin boys. A struggle which would be played out after their births, uh, played out uh, with their descendants. 
Esau's descendants would become bitter enemies of the children of Israel. Israel, Esau was an Edomite and the Edomites became enemies of the children of Israel. You can remember last time we spoke of the spiritual battle that lay behind this. Satan was waging a battle to try and stop the seed of the woman being born. So Rebecca has a problem, but she does the right thing with her problem. We read she went to inquire of the Lord. She gave herself to prayer, pleading with God to reveal to her the meaning of what was happening. And we read the Lord heard her and answered her. And so that brings us, thirdly, to the big picture. God graciously reveals what is happening and what is going to happen. In verse 23, he says, Two nations, two peoples, will come from these twins, but they will be separated there's going to be a division. One of them will be stronger than the other and one will serve the other. And the key is in those words, the older will serve the younger. So it's the younger son who is to receive the birthright and be the material and spiritual head of the family the one who will inherit the promises of the covenant that God had made with Abraham and carry on the messianic line which is traced right through scripture to the coming of Christ the Messiah. Now last time we spoke of why God should set aside the usual human way of doing things. And that was to remind each and every one that his salvation, his plan of salvation and his carrying out of that plan is all of grace, sovereign grace. And uh, God often does this kind of thing in the history of redemption. If we go right back, Seth was not the firstborn, Isaac was not the firstborn. Jacob, the one we focus on this evening, Jacob was not the firstborn, or Judah, or David. So God is revealing the big picture, which is the work of his sovereign grace in the outworking of his plan of salvation. And so we come on fourthly to consider the birth. We look at verses 24 to 26. Now, this is very significant because here the boys also receive their names. And as you know, in the Old Testament, the name uh, that is given to a newborn uh, is uh, speaks of their character and uh, so we, we, we find in the naming of the two sons hints as to their future character. If we take uh, first of all Esau, we read he came out, he emerged red or ruddy the Hebrew word is Edmoni, from which we get Edom, Edmoni. Uh, but he's not only red, he's hairy. And the Hebrew there is Adareth Sear, from which we get Esau. He later lived in Seir which again speaks of 
the background that uh, the land of the land he will live in. So we're getting hints here uh, about Esau. But then the second is born, and even more symbolically, Jacob is born grasping Esau's heel. Now the word, the Hebrew word is akev. So he was called the one who takes by the heel. A cave, a heel catcher. And the picture there is one who is catching another by the heel to trip them up, to supplant them, to deceive them. So we're getting the hint that here is one who will be aggressively self-seeking. In verse 36 of chapter 27, we read of that. Verse 36 of chapter 27, where uh, we read, uh, Isaac says to Esau after he has sold his birthright, I have made him, that is Jacob, lord over you, and have made all his relatives your his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine, so what can I possibly do for you now, my son? I have made him lord over you. And uh, so we see the significance we see that Jacob, by nature, is a supplanter, a schemer. And so, as one commentator puts it, there is no character in Holy Scripture who was more closely, who more closely manifests the glory of divine grace in dealing with the most forbidding of materials. But in holding the latter up, to nature. Here, says the commentator, we see ourselves in the story of Jacob. In other words, this is the way we are all by nature. Basically, we're out for ourselves, no matter what it costs others. So, the births. We come on fifthly then to consider the boys. Verse 27, chapter 25, verse 27. The boys grew up. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. What a contrast we have, not just in appearance and in pursuits and interests, but in temperament and character as well. Esau was an outdoors man. He loved sport. He loved the thrill of the chase. He was, as we might say today, a man's man. But we see that he is living for pleasure, for immediate gratification. His motto seems to be, seize the day, live for today. Don't worry too much about the future. Eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die, which of course is the philosophy of many people in this world. He's a man who goes his own way, who does his own thing. Uh, we see this in chapter 26, verses 30 and 34 and 35. When he was 40, he married Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Basimath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. 
And these wives were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. He was doing his own thing. Here he is, a man of the world, a sportsman. If we were around today, no doubt he would be either engaged in sport or following sport or talking about sport. So there he was, attractive, but impetuous, rash, living for the sinful pleasure of the moment. But you'll have noticed when we read from Hebrews chapter 12, the comment it makes about Esau. It says, he was godless. The King James Version says, profane. Again, an interesting word that has a Latin root. If you break the word down, it's profanum, which means outside the temple. In other words, here is someone who has no time for God or God's house. Here's one who lives for himself, who lives for the moment. And as one commentator puts it, he wasted the splendid man manhood God had given him. But what about Jacob? Well, very interestingly, he's called in the international version, a quiet man. Quote, a quiet man staying among the tents, end quote. Now that word quiet, it's interesting to find that it's the same word that's used of Job in Job chapter 1, when we read that Job was a, a blameless man, a man of integrity. So we can translate that word uh, as a complete man, a sound man, peaceful, well-rounded, uh, wholesome, solid, mature, level-headed, those kind of things. So we can say that here was a boy who had learned about God and his promises from his parents and he knew very well that he would be the inheritor of the promises and he's taking it very seriously. He's wanting to see God's will being done. The only problem, as we'll see, is that he wasn't prepared to wait for God's time. But here are two characters held up for us, for our consideration. And the challenge really is, which of the two are we like? Have we time for God or no time for him? But then we come on to see in the sixth place, the blunder. We see that in verse 28. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And I say that's a blunder because we see here an example of something that is disastrous in a family, and that is favoritism. It's disastrous to the cause of family harmony and also disastrous to the cause of spiritual growth. Isaac admired his son Esau's prowess and encouraged him in the irresponsible lifestyle that he had chosen. And he became so partial to him that he was prepared to try and go against the clearly revealed will of God and see that the, the birthright was passed on to Esau, whereas God had made it clear, no, this was not the way to go. So it says he loved Esau, but we read then Rebekah loved Jacob. Yes, she knew he was the child of promise, and he was 
as far as we can read here, such a good and uh, mo a good model son. He comes across as being responsible. He's staying at home, helping at home, getting on with the work. Not a bit like the elder brother, but a bit like the elder brother in the story Jesus told of the prodigal son, while Esau was like the younger, except of course that Esau did not repent of his sin like the prodigal. But unfortunately, even though Rebecca knew the truth and knew what must happen, she didn't do what she had done in the past. She didn't go to the Lord to wait for him, to plead with him for an answer and for help and guidance. We could say she wanted the right thing, but she encouraged Jacob to be true to his old crafty nature, his deceiving nature. Uh, why, we ask, was this whole matter not firmly sorted out with the boys before they grew up so that they would know what lay ahead and that they would do God's will? So there is a lesson here, isn't there, for, for parents, a very practical lesson. But we come seventhly and finally to consider the bargain. We see that, that in verses 29 to 34. And uh, this incident shows us the two boys. Jacob plays on Esau's weakness. He shows himself as the ruthless opportunist. The sh he, he's sharp in the uptake and he takes advantage of his brother. And um, he tricks him into parting with the birthright and transferring it to his younger brother. He's clever. Uh, not only does he ask for a, a promise, or what we might call a gentleman's agreement, no, he binds Esau with an oath. He gets Esau to swear an oath and such oaths were binding. But his sharp practice was to reap a bitter harvest. A bitter harvest in his future, future relationship with his brother in later life. And really we could say that Jacob never had real peace until he was reconciled with his brother. So here he is, not waiting for God to work things out in his time, but persuaded by his mother, cool and calculating, cunning and crafty, some people would say, as maybe he would have said, well, the end justifies the means. But of course it doesn't. We've got to do things God's way. As Christians, we can learn, I think, three things from Jacob and his mother. Three very simple, basic things. Firstly, trust and pray. Secondly, Wait and pray. And thirdly, watch and pray. 
and then there's Esau. He shows himself to be the feckless and careless person that he was. He is one who must have immediate needs met. He doesn't really care about the long-term important things. He's short-sighted. He's materialistic. The birthright is something way in the distance. It's a shadowy thing. It's a thing of little use to him uh, in his life at that moment. As he says, what good is this birthright to me? And so the comment of scripture is, Esau despised his birthright. And after all, he probably thought, I'll be able to make things right when the time comes. He has got his needs met now. And these are the things that are important for him. And so he goes down as a profane person. One who really spiritually was an outsider. Could it be that there are those who are listening today who are questioning their spiritual birthright? Maybe as the children of godly parents, they can see that their task is to follow in the ways of their parents, to commit themselves, as our opening psalm said, to commit themselves to the Lord and to a life of obedience to him. But Esau said, what good is that? And maybe you're saying that today. What good is there in that? Could it be that you're despising your birthright? Your birthright? Are you like the poet who said, I once was a stranger to grace and to God. I knew not my danger. I knew not the Lord. When friends spoke in raptures of Christ on the tree, Jehovah, said Kenyu, meant nothing to me. Could it be that there's one who doesn't really care about God's word? Who doesn't really care about the gospel? Who is not really interested in the church? They're outsiders like Esau. All that Christ went through for sinners doesn't mean anything to you. If that is the case, may God speak to you through our look here at these two boys. Esau became a believer by grace. Esau continued in the ways of sin. And the lifestyle that he was living brought great grief to his parents and caused great trouble in the days to come. So God willing, we'll carry on our study of Jacob uh, this evening. But for now, we bow in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this account of what happened early in the lives of Isaac and Rebecca and their twin boys. We thank you, Lord, that you provided a true firstborn, even the Lord Jesus Christ, who became the head of his people and the spiritual leader who offered the once for all sacrifice. We think, Lord, of that battle that was going on even within the very womb of Rebecca. And uh, 
that speaks to us of the battle that there is between the evil one and the Lord who has a plan to bring the evil one to final defeat. So thank you for that big picture that uh, there, there is one coming who will destroy the head of the serpent, who will crush his head. We thank you then for revealing to us that salvation is all of grace and we rejoice in your grace that um, that uh, made us, that uh, redeemed us, that brought us into the fold and family of Christ. We think, O oh Lord, of what we see here even in the naming of these two boys, uh, Esau, who lives only for the moment, and Jacob, who is a cheat and a supplanter. But we thank you that your grace was able to change uh, Jacob, and we see that in the new name that he got, Israel a prince with God, one who strives with God and who is blessed by God. Help us, we pray, those of us who are parents, we pray in the upbringing of our children that we would be always fair in all our dealings and that the children would grow up to be healthy in a spiritual way so hear our prayers, Lord, as we pray for our children. We pray that uh, they would follow Jacob's God. So grant, Lord, that we might value our birthright and uh, that we might close in on it and lay hold of it and live by the grace that flows from it in the days to come. We ask it for Jesus' sake. The grace of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, be with you all. Amen.